Uh, okay, so changing gears here. Uh, you know, many of you have written, well, you had to write a proposal to get admitted to this school, uh, you know, as you do your thesis or as you do a postdoc and you want to get data. Uh, you need to write compelling uh, proposals that will get you observing time. And then maybe in the future, you need to write compelling proposals that will give you jobs or that will get you uh, grants. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really important skill uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to write a good proposal uh, that gets accepted. Um, so I think that uh, this talk is mostly focused around uh, telescope proposals, observing proposals. Um, but, uh, but a lot of the ideas are, are similar to, uh, to what you would, uh, what you face uh, in, in those other kinds of proposals. So I think the number one thing to think about uh, in uh, writing proposals, the reviewers are overworked, they're not necessarily expert uh, in, uh, in, in your field or in what you're proposing. Um, they'll know the big picture of astronomy, the, you know, you tell them, I want to look at black holes, and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of those. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and they are, you know, a typical, on a typical panel, you might get dozens or even a hundred proposals that you have to read. Uh, and so the amount of time that a reviewer might spend on your proposal could be as short as five minutes, right? You just spent 20 hours writing this proposal and someone's going to read it in five minutes and make a judgment on it. And typically more than one person is reading it and there'll be some discussion, but the, the, the time that goes that reviewers have to, to look at this is, uh, can be quite limited. And panels, including the SMA panel, is, uh, they're oversubscribed. There's people are requesting more time than there is available uh, on the telescope. Uh, and that means that, not that the reviewer, the reviewers are not malicious, but they need some, you know, they need some justification to, uh, to make their decisions between what they accept and, and, and what they reject. And so, at some level, reviewers are looking for reasons to reject your proposal because they see lots of good ones. And if they find flaws in your proposal, then that's a reason to, to send it back. Um, I love this expression. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Uh, it's attributed to many, many people. Uh, but the, 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 the underlying idea there is that um, Good writing uh, takes time and, uh, and it takes, uh, you know, it, it takes thought, it takes care. Uh, you know, if you, you sit down to explain something uh, and you just kind of spill it all out all at once, it tends to come out to be a little bit of a mess. Uh, so prepare in advance. Know your science, know what the question is that you're gonna, you're gonna be working on. Know the instrument. Uh, know what it is that the SMA can do, uh, what it can't do. Um, know the proposal requirements. How many pages of text can you have? How many figures can you include? Things like that before you set out writing things. Get the, get the, get the proposal template uh, uh, and, uh, and look at that uh, in advance. And then give yourself time to, uh, to revise. Now this is all ideal. Uh, obviously a lot of proposals get written uh, you know, in the last four <coughs> hours where got to do this because uh, it's a great idea but uh, you know if you you know if you don't if, if you if you have the time do these things <coughs> proofread get a second reader uh, you know these it's very useful uh, you know normally you're writing in a collaboration uh, and so you 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 will maybe naturally have people who are also reading what what you're writing as you go or contributing, but uh, you need to be consistent in your language throughout the proposal and in your description of the goals and tech techniques. Um, and, uh, you know, know that small mistakes can hurt you. Again, coming back to that point that, um, you know, inconsistencies reveal maybe that you're not thinking everything all the way through or have given enough care to, to putting this together. And of course, you know, if if your second reader can't uh, can't follow uh, what your argument, uh, 
Uh, how in the world is that panelist who's got five minutes to understand it uh, and is not an expert going to do it? Um, and then finally, um, you know, tell a good story, right? Uh, you're not you're not entertaining the the the, the reviewer, but uh, but you want to give people uh, give the reviewer a sense of the big picture, how you're going to contribute to it. Explain how it fits into the context of your thesis or your overall program. If you've got multi wavelength data that, that this is contributing to, that's a really big selling factor. It's very, very strong component. Uh, uh, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, novelty is always good. Uh, I can tell you that you know, I've been on an infinite number of panels, and uh, you know, you see certain kinds of proposals over and over again. Uh, and then somebody writes something to do something you've never heard of before. You get kind of excited to read it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so that's, you know, that's finding what's novel in what you're doing uh, is, uh, is compelling. And then you want to convey your excitement to, about, you know, why this is important, why it matters. Um, you know, why should, there, why should the reviewer care uh, about this? There are lots of, lots of good proposals that don't get time on the telescope uh, because they don't look like they're, they're going to change things in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. They look like they're just one more step, and now, which can be a fine, you know, it can be a fine strategy, but, uh, and lots of proposals get funded, get supported for that reason, but, uh, but it doesn't come off as very exciting. Just completing something. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, okay, so the, the basic outline of, of what you want to do, you want to give the context, you want to give the big picture, um, and then you need to start narrowing your, uh, you know, the, 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 to the specific problem that, that you're addressing. Uh, and, then, and then you need to narrow even further. How are you going to, with these observations, going to address uh, these, uh, these overall issues? And then you've got to go into the details, uh, you know, a technical justification that, you know, why did you choose the sources that you chose? What was your selection criteria? Um, you know, what's the, what is the right, uh, you know, flux density cutoff uh, to use? Um, you know, who's going to reduce the data? Uh, you know, do you have a credible plan to do that? Uh, uh, and things along those lines. And then, you know, a punchy statement at the end or near the end uh, of, of your su summarizing what, what you're doing, that bringing it all back together, uh, right? Because as you, as you go through the story, uh, right, and you get more and more detail, you want to at some point bring it back to here's the big picture. Here's why I'm doing this. Here's why you should care that I'm doing this. Um, so, so that's a that's a structure. That's a linear structure. But kind of throughout the proposal, you need there are kind of themes that you you may want to uh, to come back to and. Uh, Again, what is the narrative? What is the story that, that you're trying to tell? How is this, how is this part of a larger program, or how does it, how does it solve a, a problem or uh, raise a problem, create a problem? You know, clearly, if you're applying to use the SMA, you want the reviewer to be uh, convinced that uh, uh, the SMA is. Uh, you know, a really important part of solving this problem. If, uh, if you're just getting one tiny piece of, of information and it's just a little add on, it can be hard to, it can be hard to, to sell that. And so you, you need to show the importance uh, of, of those, of, of that. Do you know how to use the SMA? Will you make good use of the, uh, of the, of the data that, that you obtain? And do you, will you set up a good observing program to make this work? Um, and then most, you know, most proposals fall into this category of steady progress. Uh, and, and that's good, you know, we're, uh, science in many ways is very conservative type, type of regime. But there is a role for high risk, high reward uh, types, of, uh, types of experiments. I encourage you all to think about, about this, not necessarily as the, 
is the you know one unique thing that you're going to be doing, uh, although some people do that. Uh, but uh, you know we're we are in a field where you can be surprised uh, in in a discovery and you know transform things. And some fraction of the telescope time should go towards high risk, high reward types of activities. And it's good for some fraction of everyone's time to go to those. And it varies depending on where you are and what, what, what you're doing. Um, okay, so some of, the, some of the tools or some of the more specific things uh, to think about straightforward title and abstract. You know, when you, uh, when a reviewer sees, you know, the first thing you see is you see, it's a title and then you read the abstract and if you come away, if the reviewer doesn't come out of the abstract having a, having a clear idea of where everything is going, uh, you're probably in pretty bad shape uh, at that point. Um, I always write the abstract last after I've written everything else uh, because that's when I actually finally understand what it was that I was trying to do. <laughs> Um, figures are really central, clear figures that illuminate uh, your ideas. You know, a dense page of text uh, can be really intimidating, hard to read. I actually have a bone to pick with the SMA proposal format, which is that it is two pages of text and then two pages of, of figures. And uh, I find it much easier to, to read things where the figures and the text are intermixed. Uh, uh, and many other observatories have that, that kind of format. But in a, either way that it's structured, um, clear figures that reveal what your problems are, what the data is, uh, what you're going to find. Um, itemized lists, bulleted lists, often very effective. Uh, you know, here are the top three things I expect to measure uh, in, with this experiment. Um, Again, also headings, italics, boldface for structure and emphasis. You can't, you don't want to overuse these things. You don't want to ita italicize every other sentence. But a handful of uses of that can be effective to draw attention to uh, points to, you know, wake up the, the, the reviewer. Um, Jargon-free language. Again, the, the reviewer is not an expert in your field. Uh, and... Uh, and of course, you have to use some of the jargon of your field, otherwise your proposal will be 20 pages long. Uh, but, uh, but you need to limit it. Uh, and, uh, and when you use it, you need to, uh, you need to define it. Um, you need to show that you understand the context. You need to show you understand the past work that's been, been done uh, in a field. Uh, and. Uh, you know, you're not the only person working on high mass star formation or black holes or galaxy evolution. Uh, and, uh, and you need to, to make that clear. And then in terms of the technical justification, all the tools that the observatory gives you, those are really important. The sensitivity calculator, the data archive, make sure that you know that, that this source has not been observed before. You might be able to short circuit your whole process <laughs> <laughs> by going to the data archive and just getting the observation uh, rather than waiting six months to, you know, for it to, to be observed. Uh, or if there is, uh, you know, similar, if there are similar objects that have been observed, uh, make use of that. I've made use of data archives throughout my career and it's been incredibly effective. It's a great way to, to get, get things done. Um, okay. Common mistakes. This slide is a common mistake uh, for the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I didn't have enough time to make it better. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, I put way too much information on this slide. Uh, but, I, but it's in part because there are so many mistakes that, that get made. Uh, you know, don't violate the proposal guidelines. Uh, there are you know, there are reviewers who will just, you know, zero out of five if, you know, you, you turn in four and a quarter pages uh, instead of four. Uh, and, you know, don't do it. If the guidelines say four pages and 12 point font and one inch margins, you know, 
don't violate those those guidelines. Uh, don't use too much jargon. Don't try to squeeze in too much information. One equation, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's an art to make good figures, um, and you want to. You want your figures to be rich with information, but not overwhelming. Uh, and you know, finding that finding that balance is uh, is hard. Um, there's some really there's some really good books by uh, Edward Tufte on graphic design uh, that I recommend people look at uh, for thinking about figures. Um, he's an architect uh, and but uh, has you know a really interesting suggestion. Uh, you know, technical errors uh, like unexplained source selection uh, or the wrong observing mode or calculating things incorrectly using the, the, the sensitivity calculator. Um, other things I've already mentioned. And then generic language, be specific about what it is that you're going to do, how, it's, how the measurement you're going to make is, is going, to, going to contribute. But don't overpromise. You know, don't say I am going to solve the problem of you know, coevolution of galaxies and black holes. You're not. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna do something interesting in that domain, but don't overpromise. Uh, but be sure to have focus questions, right? And the great thing about focus questions is that is that there are there are multiple possible answers to them, right? And one of the one of the things that often comes up is you know, I want to observe this, we want to see how bright it is, and we'll use how bright it is to, you know, constrain some parameter. What if you don't detect it? What, you know, how does that, how does that go into, uh, uh, you know, a result? Is the time just lost? It's no longer interesting? Probably not, but making the case that, uh, um, that a non-detection is, is of use, uh, for, uh, for your science uh, is, is often a really valuable thing to include. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna do something a little risky here, which is I took one of my proposals, one of my past <laughs> SMA proposals here, uh, and, uh, and just kind of walk through some of the things that we did. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, as representative of, of, uh, of this, uh, and so, I'll just say right off, this proposal has been both successful and unsuccessful. Uh, and I'll explain why it was unsuccessful uh, at the end. Uh, so successful, I, you know, so simple title, right? You read that, you, you know, we're going to do something about variability in, in this class of objects. Big picture, we're talking about black holes. We're putting it in, uh, in terms of general relativity. We're, um, you know, we're covering we're giving multi-wavelength context by, you know, here are people who did this something similar in the optical, in the x-ray, at other wavelengths, and, and put that together. Um, and then within a few paragraphs, by the third paragraph here, we're narrowing down the scope. And we're talking about our past work. This is one of my collaborators on this proposal. In fact, work that evolved data from the SMA. Um, we then introduced some, some jargon, damped random walk, uh, right? Nobody knows what a damped random walk is. But then we explain it, and that's the only jargon, or it's, uh, at least in my view, it's the only jargon. Maybe you read this and you see lots of jargon, but that's, you know, we limit the amount of, uh, the, the amount of uh, jargon. Um, we go on, we give some more narrow context, we show we, show we use the archive, the SMA calibrator database. <laughs> um, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're quantitative in, in some ways, and then we come back to the big picture again. And then we propose, what are we gonna do? We propose, this is what we're gonna do. It's right here. Uh, and uh, you know, the reviewer should not come away from the proposal saying, why is it that they want to do this? Or what is it that they want to do? We propose to do this, and that's what we're doing. Um, again, more narrower context. Here's my use of italics. These new observations will test, right? So that is, you know, we're specifically going after that uh, test. Um, the, uh, and then, we end in a kind of, a, at least this section, in a punchy way. We're back to the 
we're back to the big picture, uh, right? This is a key question, is whether jets power submission in a low luminosity AGM. And potential targets for the Event Horizon Telescope, right? Everybody loves the Event Horizon Telescope. So we're <laughs> hitching our wagon to the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, uh, you know, for these, uh, for these measurements. And, you know, they're, it's connected. It's part of that science picture. Um, and then observation plan and technical justification, the specific plan, you know, how bright are the sources? What configuration can we observe them in? Um, what kind of time cadence do we need? In this case, this is a, a you know a monitoring uh, kind of observation. And then we have our pages of figures. We got a, a a big picture figure. This is where all the objects are, and this is how it fits together. It's time to explain it to you. Uh, but we have light curves involving our SMA data. We reduced our data. You know that. It says we, we've taken data before, we reduced it, and we showed it right here. Uh, and then an analysis figure. We know how to analyze our results. We didn't just collect the data, but we know how to analyze it. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, the reviewer may look at this and okay, I don't know what that means exactly, but they know at least that we did something. And we didn't just, we didn't just collect the data, we're not just sitting on it. Um, you know, it's important to get references right, but it can be really compact should not swallow up your, your proposal. Um, so, okay, so that's all, the, that's all the great things about this proposal. We, it was a monitoring proposal. We got on for several cycles and, uh, and then we didn't, get, uh, we didn't get renewed and that's because we stopped producing our data. Uh, because <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a completely justified uh, uh, criticism from the panel, thank you. Uh, and uh, we're working on it. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back and repropose when, uh, uh, when we've reduced our data and we've figured out where that fits on the big picture. Um, okay, so your proposal didn't get approved. This happens all the time. Uh, don't despair. Uh, you know, that is, uh, it's, it's a part of the process. It's often totally random. You know, as I said, you, reviewers put a, as, Reviewers act in good faith, but they have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of expertise. And, uh, and so sometimes they just get it wrong. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, but in any case, read the comments, you know, maybe you weren't clear about something, uh, you know, or you need to rethink something, you know, maybe the reviewers did really find uh, a flaw or a concern that, that needs to be, to be explored. Take it as, you know, valuable feedback. Uh, but, you know, don't give up on your idea. Uh, don't give up on your plan. Uh, get someone else to read it. Get someone else to look at the comments. Revise, resubmit, go back to it again. Uh, you know, if you thought it was good enough to write the proposal the first time, as long as, it's, as long as it holds up after you thought through the reviewer comments, then go back to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, many, many times that's a successful strategy. Um, Okay, uh, I was just going to walk through a few kind of mechanical things here at the end. Uh, so SMA has a website, uh, which you've probably all seen, um, but which talks about proposing, how to propose. Uh, array status and technical information. This is what the instrument is capable of doing. Look at this. This will tell you what you can do. People put a lot of time and effort into assembling that information. Um, the SMA works on a, a, a biannual basis, semi-annual basis, right? So proposals in the fall and in the spring, uh, typically, uh, for, uh, for uh, observing periods that then start uh, a few months later. You need to have, a, you need to have a, uh, uh, an account in order to do this that's easy enough to generate. Um, and then the other, the other thing to be aware of is that uh, there are large-scale key projects uh, that get carried out. So you're probably, if, as SMA beginners, you're probably thinking about oh, one eight hours to do this object or 16 or whatever. But uh, if you're Cardo, you're thinking about how oh, I want 500 hours to do my project. Uh, and, uh, and there's a mechanism to, to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, in the long term, you should be thinking about those things. Um, this is the archive. I just did a I just did a quick search uh, around Sagittarius A star, uh, and uh, you know tons of data sets uh, come up here. 
right? And they're available. You can just click on the link and download the data and, and run off and make an image. And uh, I think there's a lot of work being done on, um, you know, getting to, uh, um, uh, you know, producing images directly out of these, uh, out of the archives. Um, the sensitivity calculator, uh, this is what the output of that looks like. You get your, your UV coverage, you get uh, your point spread function uh, for a <laughs> sample observation that you would put together, uh, and you get sensitivities for, you know, if you need the, if you're using the full bandwidth of the correlator, or if you're doing a, a line observation. Uh, this is an incredibly useful planning tool, right? So don't propose for a one microjansky source uh, <laughs> unless you want to be like Cardo and ask for a thousand hours. <laughs> Um, number keeps going up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how to use this tool, but if you're into spectroscopy, <laughs> uh, you probably want to use it, right? So it's, uh, I, I, a long time ago, I learned that atomic and molecular spectroscopy is not for me. Uh, but there are a lot of molecules out there. Some of you probably care about them. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really important tool for, for doing that kind of planning of uh, of, of what kind of, uh, you know, frequency coverage uh, that, that you can get uh, out of the correlator. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the very wide bandwidth of the SMA is very powerful for getting multiple spectral lines uh, at once, and you can be very clever in your configuration for, for making use of that. And then here's the, uh, here's the calibrator archive. Uh, Mark uh, Gerwell puts this together. This is a fantastic database, and this is probably the most beautiful source in, in this database is uh, 3C84, uh, which over the course of uh, the, uh, I guess it's about 15 years of, of, of data here, uh, you know, has gone through this enormous rise, 230, 345 gigahertz. It's a part of some centuries long activity that's that's going on in the source, but just a <coughs> sort of beautiful activity. Very useful both for, um, both for, the archival purposes of doing science with some of these objects, but also for planning your, your observations and setting them up. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Did I say something too insulting about reviewers? <laughs> yes. So you chose four sources and you justified them as like, oh, they're all calibrators, they're near one another. I saw that. But how do you justify whether four is enough or not. And that could be some like downfall, like a tax member yeah. could, could point out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that, is a, that is a common criticism of this kind of proposal, right? Is that, is that there's, a, there's a large sample of low luminosity AGN, why these four? Why not, you know, and do you get everything all the science you want out of doing four instead of 40, maybe you should be doing 40. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the justification which, which tax typically accept is, well, sure, 40 would be better, but then I would have to ask for all of the time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, we started, in this case, we started with analyzing archival data uh, on three sources, SAG star M81, and M87. And then we, we found some relation. We said, oh, that looks interesting. Um, does, it, does it hold up when we look at some more sources? Uh, and, you know, but I have a, I have a dream of, uh, of doing 100 sources uh, and over, over a longer period of time. Uh, we're not ready yet because we stopped reducing right now. <laughs> And the four sources together, that was, the, the idea there is to simplify four sources together on the sky, they're close together on the sky. And that's to simplify uh, um, observing. So that, because this is, we only, we don't want a full track on these sources. We want about, we, we only need about 10 minutes on source to detect them, to measure their flux, and that's it. Uh, and so we want to be able to do all of our sources within about an hour. So if they're close together, that means that uh, uh, when one of them is up, they're all up, and we can observe them quickly, uh, and then the, the telescope can move on to something else. Let me suggest that we keep 
cap it there. Uh, thank okay. you again.